Hi, I'm Maria Thea Harris or Velosos on social media. Welcome back to Serve 50 podcast on Soul Gunner Style. You're listening to the Top 20 Countdown series. And that comes back to the expensive as well. It's very lovely quality mm. tarn and lawn or silk crepe de chine and it is in the pricier bracket but it's one of those cloths that's worth investing in and treasuring and making into something that you want to keep for as long as possible it will wear out of course because that's another thing with natural fibers people think oh i've bought this beautiful expensive linen it won't wear out but it does susan young has written many research pieces for sober 50 as their blog writer and this particular podcast is a reflection of one of those pieces she wrote back in 2020. This episode about natural versus man-made fibre purchases is number 11 on the top 20 countdown. Susan Young's sewing blog is still available and I encourage you to pop in and read the full research that she published back then. So thank you again for being on the podcast for Sober 50. Sit back with your cuppa and relax while we listen to Susan Young's research piece for Sober 50. This is part two of Susan Young of Susan Young Sewing's blog post about her discussion around fabric choices. So we started it last week and this is part two because we didn't cover everything and today I think we we're going to be able to cover everything. What do you think Susan? <laughs> let's give it a go. <laughs> yes, let's There's do so that. much more to be discussed. <laughs> and honestly the Discussion on the Sober 50 account about fabric choices and what drives their choice was quite in depth. So I think it deserves two parts, doesn't it? I think you're right, yes, because the area that we didn't cover last time, we were talking about the pros and cons of natural fibres over man made fibres because that's become a really big topic. So, natural fibres, there's only a very few categories of them. So you've got cotton, you've got wool, you've got silk, and you've got linen, mm -hmm. the originals, as it were, and they've been in use as a textile for thousands of years, absolutely, you know, forever. And then since the beginning of the last century, early in the last century, they managed to start manufacturing artificial versions of fabrics, chemically creating. So you had nylon came along and then obviously polyester. Some of those were entirely chemical and there still are fabrics that are constructed entirely by chemical means. Yeah. And you've got also the ones like viscose that are manufactured from a natural source but they have been chemically engineered to become a textile. So viscose now is, I don't know, I've got no figures to back this up, but it just feels like viscose is one of the most prevalent fabrics out there. It's relatively cheap and it's quite durable. You can print on it well. It can be woven into lots of different fabric types. Yeah. That's another thing that people, you start to learn, as I, and I did touch on it in the blog post, is those people who know nothing about textiles think that cotton is cotton and cotton isn't. Cotton is what it's made from, yeah. but it can be made into a massive number of different fabric types. So it ranges from very fine. So a soft cotton voile is a really fine sheer fabric. Yeah. And then you work your way up. Denim is made of cotton and that's a twill weave. And that's so durable, really, really heavy duty or tarpaulin or something for making tents. And they can all be cotton. That's just something that you start to learn. I had the, the advantage when I'm doing an O-level and an A-level and then a college. So you study fabrics and fibres a lot. I mean, I've forgotten loads of it, but I still remember enough of it that it is really, really helpful. And you can't replicate that education very quickly or easily. And I, much as I would really love to be able to. So people need to make their own mistakes when it comes yes. to buying fabric. If I can help someone not make an expensive mistake, as I said last week, then that's great. I'm really happy about that. But you have to learn. I still make mistakes as well. So going back to natural fibres, particularly popular one now, because it isn't better for the planet in terms of natural fibres, is linen. Because when it comes to cotton, people 
are not aware of just how much impact it has on the planet. Yeah. It's production, I mean, on so many levels. So initially we're talking about the vast amount of water that the plant needs, using a lot of chemicals on it to keep infamous boll weevil at bay. So the chemicals then would have a detrimental effect on the workers who work with it. Then you get into the realms of slavery as well. Mm -hmm. in the early days of production in the South of America in particular. So it's it's got a really checkered history and it isn't quite the innocent fabric that you might think, oh, it's just a piece of cotton. But actually, no, if you yeah. go into it, it, it's a really, really eye-opening. And I did in the blog, I do cross-reference the exhibition that I went to at the Victoria and Albert Museum two years ago, which discussed... It was a fascinating exhibition. It discusses the way forward for textiles from where it's come from to where it's headed now. So if people haven't read that blog, I would suggest they do have a look at that one as well. It was such an eye opener. It really was. It gave me hope. It was very upsetting in a lot of ways to yeah. see how awful the textile industry has been at times. And I'm not going to deny it. It probably still is in parts of the world. It's shocking. Yeah. But there is hope and there is progress because they're looking at new ways of producing fibres and fabrics that are much more ecologically friendly, both for the planet and for humanity. So things like there was a, a vegan leather that was made from grape skins, for example, which are a byproduct of the winemaking industry. And you've got Pinyatex, which people your listeners may have heard of yep. which is made from pineapple leaves which mm -hmm. again is a byproduct of pineapple production so things like that you think gosh that's terrific that's a really good way forward so long as they don't involve harsh chemicals yeah so you can see from this there is no easy answer that's using right. natural fabrics is not necessarily the best thing unless you know it's organically produced cotton and certified as such then you don't know how it's been produced that cheap cotton may be cheap in really alarming ways that you're not even thinking about because it's not just the fiber it's also the dyes and the printing processes so yeah. And then anything else that they add into it to make it seem like it's a good quality. Yes. Yeah. So there's all these hidden things that could be in there. So there's a school of thought. Well, natural fibre is good. Man-made fibre is bad. That's not necessarily true because, as I said in the blog post, if you think about fabrics for exercise wear, active wear, swim wear, dance wear, that sort of thing, you pretty much have to make them in something that has been entirely made man-made yeah. because developments have come on in such a way. When I was at school and learning about the textiles that were new at that time, we couldn't possibly imagine the fabrics that have been developed since I was there then. So you've got wicking fabrics, for example. You, yeah. Yourself, you run, don't you? So you want to wear the fabrics that are most comfortable for running in. Back in the day, we would have only had, say, cotton jersey, which gets damp, it gets cold if you get too damp, it gets heavy and soggy. Now, you've got these beautiful, lightweight, wicking fabrics. They're entirely man-made. So there's a place for them. There is an important place for them. And it's no good somebody say, oh, no, I only ever wear linen or I only ever wear silk. Well, that's fine. But have they considered what their underwear might be made of, what their mm. exercise wear might be made of? That's right. So it's not as cut and dried. No, as it's, <laughs> it's not. Because even swimwear, what, the turn of the 1900s, I think it, they were made from wool. That's right. Wool. Yes. yes, it was. There's a hilarious swimsuit in the Victoria and Albert Museum, probably in museums all over the world, actually, there are these really natty-looking, knitted, woolen or cotton knitted swimsuits. Exactly. You know, with great long legs and they're all up to your necks and long sleeves and things. But if you try to swim in them, you probably sink in the end because they'd absorb so much water. And then you only need to look at an Elvis Presley movie with all the women who are wearing bikinis 
the fabric that's being used is a woven fabric, but it's cut on the yep. bias. It is. Sorry, it I'm is. getting too technical. Yes, and all the if they're wearing a bikini, it's like a, it's all boned and it's still like a really solid bra. Exactly. For it to stay there. Yes, yeah. it's fascinating to look back at what what we did in the past. But you can still learn an awful lot for taking those techniques forward to be able to make successful garments yeah. in, in the future. That kind of brings us to old versus new fabric, doesn't it? It does. So that's another popular area. Reduce, reuse, recycle is a phrase we hear all the time now. Yes. And as a sewing community, I think a lot of us are trying to keep that in the back of our minds. So there are some really successful bloggers and writers out there, makers, who don't tend to buy new fabric anymore. They will either buy goods from charity shops, op shops, thrift shops, whatever they're called, wherever you are. They will buy garments and chop them up and turn them into something else. Mm. So a bit refashioning. Or alternatively, they will source vintage fabric. So fabric that's not new in the first place originally but now it isn't and it's not been used for some reason so I know you were chatting with Marcia a couple of weeks ago weren't yes. you yeah and she's a wonderful exponent of using vintage fabrics because the designs on them they're completely different to what we have these days fashion's yeah. changed times change so they have a lot of interesting particularly in the 50s there was some terrific graphic yes. design yeah, we don't seem to see a lot of graphic designs now. I don't know why. It's a lot of florals and spots and things. But back then, mm. there were some really top designers were creating fabrics for textile manufacturers. I'd really love to see her fabric stash. <laughs> yes, I would too. I would. I have to see if I can go and visit her once all this is over. The lockdown is over. It would be lovely to go can see her she doesn't live a million miles away from me so uh, I did meet her at the uh, so at 50 meetup she did come along so it was lovely to meet her in the flesh but I really would like to go and see her fabrics I know. that I think the good thing in the UK is that you've got a lot of different ways of getting old fabrics through estates and op shops and things because you've you know, you've been, the UK's been around for centuries. And of course, reusing textiles is not something new either. It's what people just did as a matter of course over the centuries. So part of the reason that there's not very many existing garments from, say, the Tudor era is because the fabric was so valuable even if it, it could be the, the beautiful silks that were worn by the gentry, but even the poorer cloth worn by ordinary people, it was a valuable commodity. Mm. It cost money. The people who manufactured woolen cloth became very wealthy because mm. everybody wanted it. Everybody wanted good quality cloth. And so a fabric that you couldn't afford to waste it. So once a garment was finished with by one person, it was taken apart and it was turned into something else and handed to another person, possibly a child. So it might have gone from a, an adult woman and then down to a child. And then if the child didn't grow out of it, then the cloth might be turned into something else, maybe into a bag or a pair of shoes or something, or even given to a servant. So Fabric was used until it literally fell apart. Mm. And we don't tend to do that. We've become used to having everything that we want when we want it. Yeah. So tide is turning. I don't think we'll ever go back to that, but the tide is turning and there are some great people encouraging us to look out for older fabrics and to use them. And it's either for ethical reasons, social reasons, or just to be creative. Exactly. To have something that doesn't look like everybody else's. There are some beautiful fabrics out there being produced now, but then you see lots of people using them. It's nice to see that they've used them in different ways, but they're still the same design. And there's some quite dramatic designs out there at the moment. So they pop up rather a lot. I think the, the supplier of those fabrics has managed to get that out there to quite a number of online shops. So they're all competing with one another to sell the same cloth. Whereas, as you say, if you find some vintage fabric, then nobody else is going to have it. Then you've got heritage companies like Liberty, mm. who their designs... They've been going for a hundred and best part 150 years now, and their designs of, for their fabrics are all in their archive. Mm. So there's always new designs every year, but then they will keep producing or reissuing 
some of their previous designs and there are some really interesting ones that if uh, your listeners are not familiar with Liberty they've not been to the UK and been to the Liberty shop I'd urge them to have a look at their website simply because you can see the breadth of fabric design it really is the pinnacle of fabric design because you've got the little flowers and that you people might associate with liberty exactly and then you've got really imaginative fantasy and graphic designs you won't find plain striped or spotted cloth it is all sorts going on and that comes back to the expensive as well it's very lovely quality mm. tarna lawn or silk crepe de chine and it is in the pricier bracket but it's one of those cloths that's worth investing in and treasuring and making into something that you want to keep for as long as possible it will wear out of course because that's another thing with natural fibers people think oh i've bought this beautiful expensive linen it won't wear out but it does the only oh. things that don't wear out are the man-made ones which goes back to being the, the planet protecting the planet because they never break down but if you're going to wear it forever then keep wearing it there is nothing wrong there's a bit of snobbery with natural versus man-made but there is a place for man-made we just need to be careful quantity that we keep producing of it. That's right. Like it's just been really great A to catch up with you and B, I love when you put a blog post together, whether it's for Sober 50 or 4 the makes that you do, yeah. because you give so much to the sewing community. You've always got as many sides of the story as possible. And I always learn from them and they're fun to read. Oh great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I always try to see it from as many angles as possible because whilst it is an opinion piece, I'm very much bringing in other people's opinions as well in this particular area. The same with the batch sewing one that's coming up as well. That yeah, that's going to be one to look forward to. From my perspective, thank you so much for being the official blog writer for Sew Over 50. <laughs> Oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> you do an amazing job every single time. And it's really oh. great that, you know, this one blog post we've been able to cover in two podcasts because of the depth of the work that you put together. Yeah. Thanks again for being on Sell When I Style podcast. It's been my pleasure. Always <laughs> lovely to chat with you, Maria. This episode of Sub 50 Podcast on Soul When I Style was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Susan Young, sound by bensound.com. Many thanks for the ongoing support of the podcast Patreon contributors. On patreon.com forward slash organized style, you can support this podcast every month for the cost of a coffee. Their ongoing support enables me to develop this podcast for free. You can subscribe to Soul Organized Style Podcast, but with an S not a Z on all good podcast apps. Make sure you go back and listen to our free Sub 50 podcast archive on Soul Organized Style Podcast. If you would like to contribute to the many ongoing posts and challenges the team promotes on the Sober 50 account on Instagram, direct message Sandy and the editorial team. The Sober 50 community has over 50,000 followers. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>